FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm. Welcome to another episode of uh, Agile FM, and today I'm here with Niels Pflegen. Niels can be reached at Twitter um, at N I E L S P F L A E G I N G. He's an author, speaker, consultant. Uh, but most importantly, an, an author of several books. Uh, one of them is Organized from Complexity, that is uh, already in the third edition, was recently uh, released. And the book I want to talk about with him today is, in particular, that's Complexity Tools, and that is a book that will be released by the end of April 2018 in English that was published with uh, Silke Hammond. But today it's just Niels here uh, speaking with me about this book. But first and foremost, welcome to the podcast, Niels. Thanks for inviting me, Joe. It's a pleasure. Pleasure here as well. Thanks for carving out time. Niels, you are, um, you know, uh, from, a, from a description, I, I'm just going to read out a few things. So you're a vegetarian, um, you have no driver's license, and uh, you never <laughs> owned a car, right? And that makes you very, very different in this world. Um, and it shows the way how you think a little bit. And that's why I'm saying this, your style or your way of how you publish your books, how you write the books, and especially your talks, um, that somewhat represent that kind of description. Uh, tell me maybe a little bit of why that is the case. Why vegetarian? Why no driver's license? Why no car? Um, I, I, I think that being a vegetarian and not having a driver's license is not so radical, not so unusual. Um, and this um, new book, Complexity Tools, is my sixth, my sixth book, no, fifth book. Yeah. And we thought of including something personal at the end of the book. So we thought about, okay, let's yeah. tell the readers if they like a couple of stories about ourselves. And let's, mm -hmm. let's, and let's even talk about ridiculous details. And being a vegetarian, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's, it's rather ridiculous, really. Yeah. Um, but yes, um, it's um, part of the, the book project of this book is to, we wanted to, to make it personal and to be blunt and, and very... Um, Let's say very clear throughout yes. the whole book. One of the, the ideas of this book, Complexity Tools, is not to be moralistic, never to raise the, the, or the finger, uh, never pointing at anybody, not be moralistic, but to be, to be very, very clear. Yes. We try I, to do that uh, mm -hmm. on all pages. Yeah. Yes, you, I think that's the word I was um, looking for, blunt, right? So blunt is, is um, your book is written in a very specific style. It's very easy on the eye with the, with the pictures, the elements, and so forth, you can make very easy. Um, it, it, it's almost like you can read them uh, on an elevator, right? At least one of those complexity tools, because it's just a, a page or two, and it gives you an idea and something to to try. Um, but the book's language is also very engaging and controversial. I, th these are the things I that really came came out for me when I read this. You're very you're very specific. You're very clear in terms of the boundaries of of things. You you're basically saying that mm. the leadership has to change and so forth. Complexity cannot be managed or nor reduced. It can only be tackled with human skill. So there is no other other uh, approach to that. And you defend yes. that clearly, which I think is awesome for yes. um, audiences. But why is it so important for you in particular? Well, I think um, over the last couple of years, many things have changed in our field. I mean, um, in, the, in the agile field or in the, let's say, let's say organizational development field or even the leadership field, I mm -hmm. think this, the, the, um, the willingness of people to be open for, uh, for the revolution, so to say, for the reinvention, or for, as I like to call it, for the organizational renaissance. Um, there is an openness now. There is a willingness to, to reflect. When I started um, writing and speaking and, and, and consulting 15 years ago, people were really, um, really, they were really, they were struggling with accepting that planning made no sense and that management could be dead. All those were topics I spoke about and wrote about. They were struggling with all these concepts that, you know, command and control should be over and what to do instead of planning and, 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 and what would be the alternative to bonuses and incentives. And today there is much more openness. I mm -hmm. think also thanks to uh, authors like uh, Frederick Laloux, for example, we now have, uh, um, we now have fine audiences in our field, I think, that are willing to, 
to break with the tradition. Mm -hmm. They do not know how. And this is this is why I continue to believe in, in business books and in books and in, in speaking, uh, also at conference, because I believe that the time is here for people to pick up the real mm -hmm. message, also to really get a gr grip at Agile, for example. Right. So, uh, so far, most organizations have fuddled with the tools, right? Yes. And uh, that, that's why I like to be blunt. It's That's not Agile. That's just um, creepy pseudo-Agile, so to say. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We've been doing, we've been faking, fooling ourselves I've said that this is agile, but uh, we know, I mean, most of us know that it, there's more to it. That's why in this book, we try to be blunt about complexity and its effects on organizations. And this is not a question of opinion or, or moral. We do not try to be moralistic in this book. We try to be clear about mm -hmm. that there is a science that we know a lot about, uh, of things about sociology of organizations, about mm -hmm. complexity and its effect. Yeah, and That's in the book. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and you just mentioned agile and, and conferences, right? So there are, you're going a little bit on a on a tour, um, and uh, we're gonna have some connection points in in Munich on the 26th of of April in 2018 at agilemunich.de. Uh, you will make an appearance there, uh, but you're also gonna come over a few days after that to uh, Agile NYC, where you're also gonna give a talk, and there's also other uh, keynotes and and so forth you're gonna do in North America. Uh, yes. I think it agile main and so uh, and so on. So um, there is definitely an yes. interest in the topic uh, for sure. What I saw is in in um, in your thinking is there is um, there is this dip when Taylorism uh, appeared and I, I forgot the exact time frame you you mentioned there, but there's a there's a long window where Taylorism was the was the approach of of uh, tackling complexity and and so forth, but there was. The time before Taylorism looked exactly or very similar to the time after Taylorism, as you describe, is now in the knowledge age. Um, first of all, are these two things comparable before and after Taylorism? And if so, um, why is it so hard to just do what we did before? Yes, I think as a community, um, also in the agile community, um, but in the business community, we we get we get hypnotized by current trends, you know, by blockchain and and, and digitalization and, and whatever it is, you know, we get hypnotized by the fads, mm -hmm. and we easily lose sight of the historic context of what we're doing. You know, where does management come from? Where does management and social technology come from? Where do the notion comes from that organizations must have must be commanded and controlled by managers, that we have to have sales departments or uh, very relevant to Agile. Uh, why do we have product managers in the company and uh, Agile developers on the other side or development teams on the other side? You know, mm -hmm. All these boundaries, these silos, they were dreamt up in the industrial age. It was only you know, 100 years or so ago that these mm -hmm. concepts were invented. The concept of the org chart, of budgeting, all right. these concepts uh, are recent so and there is a is a common theme between the pre-industrial age we call it the manufacturing the crafts manufacturing age and today's age which is uh, a high level of complexity in in, in value uh, creation we often think that ah, 200 years ago everything was simple and trivial scientifically speaking that is wrong it was uh, an age of complexity because the uh, crafts manufacturer or the workshop company, they had to wait for the client and uh, customize the product, something that we mm -hmm. now do. Uh, or it's the same kind of feeling that we have today when we uh, set up an agile, mm -hmm. let's say, an agile project. Yeah. Yeah. So we are back to a high level of complexity. After after 100 years or so of industrial age, in the 1970s uh, or 1980s, complexity grew back. And yeah. that is something that we still struggle with. Yeah. And John is a, it's a response to that. And this kind of organization that we describe in complexity is, uh, is a response to that. Mm. Is, th is this because there's a, a lack of body of knowledge from these pre-Taylorism uh, times? Why is it so hard? Why do we fall into this behavior of, of Taylorism if we actually have the other um, complexity and um, an approach? You, you mentioned craftsmanship, right? Why is, why is it so hard? Why do we fall into this pattern? Why is it so difficult for us to not do that anymore? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that we didn't have in the crafts manufacturing age is huge organizations. Most organizations were small. There were mm -hmm. very few organizations uh, 
150 or 200 or 300 years ago that were large. So, so the scale of globalized markets is very different from the scale of markets 200 years ago mm-hmm. in the crafts manufacturing age. So this is new. And uh, about large organizations, all we know, most of what we know, let's say 90% of what we know comes from command and control thinking, from management thinking. And maybe 10% come from the realm of Toyota, of Lean, of mm-hmm. Agile. So we are competing with um, 100 years of industrial age uh, command and control thinking and memes and language and, 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 and uh, patterns, so to say, and structures and, 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 and images of organization. Now we have to say, no, no, we have to really break away from that and say, oh, no, organizations cannot be pyramids. They must be peaches. Organizations cannot. Have, we have to eliminate the notion of project managers to be Come agile. We have to get rid of product managers to uh, have um, so that Scrum can work, for example. So uh, these are we have to really. Um, this is not a little incremental shift. It's uh, it's a renaissance mm-hmm. of thinking and of, of concepts. Mm-hmm. And we are, although of course, we are all somehow socialized in command and control imagery, and it's. It's tough sometimes to recognize that. Yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Because nobody wants to be evil or bad, and we are all infested with this, uh, with this thinking. Which is why sometimes, um, I mean, uh, as a little joke, as a, with a, with a little, with a certain sense of humor, I like to say that we need to exercise management from our organizations. People are not the problem, but uh, there is a spirit, an evil spirit in organizations that we must exercise. <laughs> <laughs> In your book, you refer to X and Y type people um, based on Douglas McGregor's work. Are you disagreeing with him or do we misunderstand him? Um, most of us, I would say, misunderstand him. I'm a big fan. I, I like to say that, again, this, uh, sorry, uh, this is not entirely seriously, but sometimes I like to say that I'm, I'm his only fan. Um, and this is a joke, of course, because yeah. because we all talk about theory X and theory Y, but um, there, there um, is a persistent misunderstanding with McGregor, a uh, persistent um, error in perception of his concept. That concept is old, of course, 55, 60 years old, but McGregor was a demon at the time, 19, in the 1960s, that theory X people, people to be motivated, people who and meet uh, the carrot and the stick that they did not exist. Mm-hmm. That the problem is not people, but uh, the organizations we have built. McGregor was very, very clear about that. Uh, and I recommend to everyone really to pick up his original book and read the book. Most people do not believe me that it's all there. Mm-hmm. McGregor understood a lot about Agile. I mean, he was maybe the, one of the main uh, mm-hmm. precursors of Agile in a way. Like Edward Stemming, of course, as well, mm-hmm. or Taichi Ono, or these Toyota people. Uh, so the origins can be found there. And I think um, if we want to understand Agile as well, if we want to understand modern organizational development, we must uh, take the, the issue of agreeing on human nature assumptions in an organization very, very seriously. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, a topic of the book as well. Yeah. So basically, you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you're saying there are only white type people. Yes, people are not donkeys, they are not children, they are not stones, they are already motivated. People cannot be motivated, that's impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we must, if we want to uh, harvest people's motivation, and this, uh, I'm not saying this in a negative, uh, I'm not meaning this in a negative sense, if we want to harvest people's motivation that they bring to the table, that they bring into organizations, we must uh, strive not to demotivate them. We must yeah. build systems that are fit for actual human beings. Command and control is not fit for actual human beings. Mm-hmm. It is neither fit for complexity nor fit for human beings. And that mm-hmm. is the, 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 the failure of command and control or management, the social technology today, is that it is neither fit for complex markets, as we have them today, mm-hmm. nor, nor for the complex work like an agile software development. And, it, and command and control or management, the social technology, is not fit for real human beings. Yeah. Are you, this, are you, this is why waterfall has never worked. Yeah, are you are you saying you can? I mean, you know, are you saying you cannot pay people more and more and more and get more motivation out of them? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. And right. that is something that uh, Frederick Frederick had Herzberg from the United States. He uncovered that in the, in the nineteen sixties as well when he said, "Ah, 
harm or pay money is just a, a hygiene factor. It doesn't make people, it doesn't motivate, it doesn't make people happy. It, the sufficient pay makes people not unhappy. Mm-hmm. You know? It avoids that people get frustrated by too little pay. So pay is important for not feeling demotivated, but it doesn't motivate anyone. The, the motivation must come from you know, purpose, participation. Yeah. Well, it might be short term. It yeah, might be ice, so. might be icing on the cake, right? In a short term, but not on a on a long term um, kind of thing. Yes. And the question is: Are you, are we in the business of uh, building short term organizations? Mm, exactly. You're Should right. think lots. Yeah. So, how do you envision salary, pay, all that stuff to happen in a in an in, in an organization you're proposing and promoting? Yes. Well, what we what we say in the book, there are some of these in the book. There are thirty three complexity tools, and mm-hmm. two of them are about pay systems as well. Uh, some of the first complexity tools in the book, I think, are about, are about pay. Mm-hmm. And there is nothing. Let's say there is nothing revolutionary there. Um, um, if we take the science of human nature or of human motivation seriously, and we have a lot of evidence that incentives and bonuses and bribes do not work, that they are an impediment to functioning teamwork, at least. Um, so the, 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 I think the, the, the conclusion must be that, okay, we have to pay people fair, mm-hmm. fair in a fair way. You know, we have to pay them enough. We have to pay them properly and fairly and then do everything to take their minds, people's minds off the money. That is something, the way I just said it, uh, that is, uh, mm-hmm. not, uh, not, you know, a phrase that I find myself, that's by Alfie Cohn, uh, uh um, an educational scientist, so to say, mm-hmm. a teacher and an education scientist. And he wrote this famous book, um, Punished by Rewards. So people like him, they already summed it up, ne- up neatly decades ago in their books and their work. So, um, and, and I think they're, they're, that is completely true. I mean, based on what we know mm-hmm. uh, about motivation and human nature, um, we should not, we should never use carrot and stick, just pay people fairly and then, do never bribe them. That is the, mm. that should be our our mantra. Right. How, never how bribe you... them because then we we focus on on doing evil stuff. Mm-hmm. Alfie Cohn beautifully sums it up, saying, "If you pay, or if you want to kill innovation, for example, pay for it." <laughs> um, so uh, never so, do that. <laughs> yeah. What about what about transparency in in all that process? What is fairness? I mean, how do we? How does you know? How would you define fairness? And how would transparency come into the mix around pay and structures and, and salary sometimes they even salary ranges of, of people in a certain job description I'm just picturing very large organizations here what's fairness yes uh, no, well what's to, well let's, let's take this apart transparency yeah. first of all it's uh, um, it is it, it is not a complexity tool for us we, we say in the book we explain that um, uh, if you want to solve any kind of problem, you know, complicated problems, uh, you can solve that with complicated tools like Excel or a ch- checklist or software. You can solve complicated problems. You can make them simple and doable and workable with machines and algorithms and rules. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in the face of complex problems, um, problems, problems that surprise you, that are new eventually, uh, you need complexity tools. You need, you need um, organizational method that is fit for the job of solving complex problems. So one of the uh, problems in the age of complexity is, is we encounter surprise all the time in our markets, in our work. Mm-hmm. People, everyone in organizations encounter surprise today in the work. You know, Until mm-hmm. the 1970s, that was somewhat different. You see that in the movies about office work in the 1950s and 60s. It's like, mm-hmm. like uh, Mad Men or so. You see that oh, it was very routine-based, you know, what people did. So not, not much surprise. Now, in, in, in Agile, for example, or in, in Scrum, uh, we appreciate that um, everybody is faced with, we, we are all faced and teams are, are faced with complexity all the time. So we have to respect and respond to that. And that makes transparency not just a, a, a tool, it is a principle. That, right. Yeah. Like it or not, we must create transparency because if we do not create high level of you know, open data, open systems, uh, visibility of data and information, then how can we expect people to respond intelligently or like entrepreneurs? It's impossible. Mm-hmm. So you say so transparency is, is it's, it's like putting the light, turning the light on so that 
people can see the problems. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like oxygen. It's yeah. not debatable. Of course, there are our, our emotions come into play, and we say, ah, we cannot make salaries transparent. People would the heads would explode, and oh my god, we would have chaos. And that's just um, I, I'm not sure how to say this. So that we don't get censored here, but mm -hmm. uh, that's just um, BS. Do you say BS? Can, can, we say, can I say BS? Yeah. It's yeah, wrong yeah. to assume that people cannot handle complex uh, transparency. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so salary, salary is transparent. People know what people are making or maybe even uh, standard fare, right? Everybody the same. Oh, that, <laughs> that is entirely different. I do not recommend that at all because, <laughs> um, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I've written about that more in other books um, of mine than previous books. But, you know, the problem with e uh, equal pay, pay, for, uh, pay for everyone, everybody earning the same, the mm -hmm. problem with that is that ultimately salaries are not, you cannot set them internally. Uh, salaries in organizations are externally referenced in the market. Ultimately, every organization, uh, say Toyota or Google, the salaries there are, are in, in a large part uh, mandated by the market. Mm -hmm. And you cannot just say, ah, damn the market, let's ignore that everybody earns the same. Uh, that is, you know, uh, you would uh, soon um, price yourself out of the market for some people and, yeah. and you know, uh, not attracting the right people. I, I don't I think that equality is not the solution to complexity. It is fairness. Like yeah. Fairness, is, you know, yeah, no, I means yeah, I, yeah. I want to definitely every person put, different. Yeah, I want to definitely put one out there just to get a reaction from you. But what about um, an organization that subdivides or, div or divides the the budget, <laughs> the 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 profit, and somehow allocates revenue as a self organized company or or group? How about that? Like this? Yes, uh, exactly. The first principle or the first complexity uh, about about pay that we have in the book is about um, uh, about um, let's say base salaries or base pay, and the second is about um, variable pay. And in variable pay, we should never. I mean, uh, if we if we're dealing with theory wide people, which we do, mm -hmm. um, you should never use bribes or bonuses or carrots and sticks. Uh, we should. If we, uh, if if that's uh, you know, if that's um, of interest, then we should have something like profit sharing or give people a share in the yeah. company. I Those see. are the models that yeah. that are fit for a complex world and fit for human beings. Yeah. Well, we don't want to give all the so for some yeah, we don't want to give all the complexity tools away here because that's what the book is, and there's there's several pages uh, where people can read up on it. But uh, I just wanted to take a deeper dive, maybe in that, <laughs> and get a little bit of a sense of what you think about it. Maybe let's touch on one more. Mm -hmm. Maybe how do you feel about recruiting uh, complexity tools? Recruiting um, in a world you're envisioning leadership would look like recruiting would be uh, probably impacted as well. What do you think about that? Yes, yes I think those that is uh, because when we when we talk about pay, I think um, many of the com concepts in the book will be uh, counterintuitive, or these concepts may may be counterintuitive. But what we say about recruiting is maybe more counterintuitive, even for most uh, of the of those who listen to mm -hmm. this podcast um, first of all this book complexity tools is it's, it's a very blue and red book everything is blue or red in this book um, because we make a distinction here you know, that um, is like a, a, a theme throughout the whole book that is um, in organizations and work we encounter two types we encounter problems that fall into the domain of the blue and or into into the domain of the red. Uh, sometimes problems have shares of both, but the blue is the complicated and the red is the co complex. That is the big theme in the book. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we have to learn, if we want to build more effective organizations also, if we want to uh, create really agile organizations, truly agile organizations, we have to learn to distinguish between blue problems, complicated problems, and red problems, mm -hmm. complex problems. Mm -hmm. And we have to treat these kinds of problems differently, you know, in, in the realm of the blue, of the complicated, you can check this suffices, you can automatize, you can standardize, you can control, you can steer, you can plan, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can write a policy or a standard for it. In the realm of the red, of the complex, we encounter surprise. So we must come up with ideas. We need really people, we need people with ideas to solve red problems. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, when you when we talk of a specific problem like uh, recruiting, the first question that I would ask is, what kind of problem is that? Is that a blue problem or a red problem? Recruiting, blue or red? 
Mm-hmm. And at least when I asked that in my talks, in my keynotes, uh, people would grasp it immediately that recruiting is not simple. It is not complicated. It is predominantly a red, a complex problem. Oh, yes. and there are some things that you can that you might automatize, but it's, it's very little. You know? mm-hmm. So it's uh, because it has to do with you know re- finding people who not only fit a job description. Job descriptions are a ridiculous blue method. And should be abolished and eliminated from organizations. Uh, ultimately, we recruit for fitness with teams who are already there, with other people, and with you know, oh, it's not it's not qualification and, and, and just fitting a description. Mm-hmm. So recruiting is, and the consequence of the, the the right method to recruit must be what we call peer recruiting. Mm-hmm. We should take away recruiting responsibilities from bosses and HR and uh, have teams recruit future colleagues. And this is a, we need, we need recruiting uh, technology like that. Of course, there are organizations that figured this out mm. quite some time ago, like Google. Um, um, but it's very important. Toyota also has very interesting, very inspiring recruiting practices, ultimately, you know, uh, even if uh, um, teamwork may not be so exciting or may not seem so exciting at Toyota, but the notion of um, peers recruiting peers or teams recruiting future colleagues is Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, crucial. In the book, we call it, this is the ultimate leadership practice that everyone, in a good organization, everyone should recruit. Mm-hmm. Everyone. Nice. So, and not HR. Yeah. <laughs> not, uh, nothing against HR, yeah. but uh, they are the least likely to be good recruiters because they are so far away from the actual That's right. teamwork and value creation happening in mm-hmm. teams. So uh, that's paramount for agile team. Agile team members should recruit future members. Right. The team. Yeah, awesome. I have a, a, a question. I'm going to ask you about a recommendation, and I don't know if there is anything with a complexity tool or not. But um, what would be your recommendation if a, if a company that is uh, uh, or used to be recently like really in the category of a startup and is beginning to grow uh, and maybe growing fast or has been growing for a long period of time and it's it's beyond the startup, it's really going into a mid-sized large company. Is there anything? Um, well, maybe they have started naturally with some of those ideas you have because it was a startup. But what kind mm-hmm. of recommendations mm-hmm. do you have to these to these companies that grow um, and, and to to somehow embrace these complexity tools? Yes, that that is something a topic that is in the book as well in the, the, in one of the first chapters. Um, uh, because for a startup, it's very natural not to have functional division. It's natural not to have departments, not to have business units, not to have these silos. You know, mm. um, this uh, organizations um, evolve into more siloed, uh, fragmented, departmentalization uh, kind of structures when they grow beyond twenty people, thirty people, fifty people, hundred people. That's when they start. They they functionally divide. During this, uh, this period of growth that a successful startup mm-hmm. eventually will uh, experience. So, a command and control, I mean, this is one of the things that we explain in the book. Um, all organizations are born as naive beta organizations, as we call it, functionally integrated, um, uh, self structured organizations. Every startup is like that. But they leave in that uh, it doesn't know why it is structured like that. It just, oh yeah, we have five people, we have seven people, we structure like we cannot, we cannot structure differently. Mm. And um, this naivety, uh, of course, it gets lost once you uh, hire the first HR person, once you create a matrix structure or hire the first consultant or create, create an HR department. So we get it from naive beta, as we call it, a, a one cell, a single cell organization to functionally divide a pyramid structure size. Mm-hmm. And uh, the recommendation is to not go there. Yeah. Uh, at, in, in the book, we describe that uh, um, every growing startup or every young organization that grows faces a fundamental decision, and most decisions slip into uh, they fall into the trap of command and control because mm-hmm. when they grow, they say, "Ah, let's control things, let's create hierarchy and." Yeah, top-down management. Let's make a budget and strategic plans and fix targets and create an incentive systems. And then you fall into the trap of uh, the pyramid system or alpha, yeah. as we call it. And the the, um, the the solution, so to say, to to sum it up a little bit, is to not go into dividing into functions, but to if you if you are, have a, uh, an organization with with just one team, let's say five to ten people, and you grow beyond that, then you must divide into two cells that can be functioning 
like on, uh, like autonomous businesses. So don't create a sales department or something like that. Create, you know, uh, like a two startup organization. And mm-hmm. if you grow beyond two teams, if you have 20, 30 people, you have to divide into three autonomously functioning teams. And every large organization that wants to be successful today must continue to and right. every growing organization must continue to divide into autonomously functioning cells and we call this functional integration and it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a highly important concept like transparency to function as an agile organization mm-hmm. to be a self-structured network and once you grow beyond that uh, for growing organizations it, it is it gets more and more important to distinguish between free and center mm-hmm. con- concept that's very important in the, in the book and for every organization yeah it is reasonable you must empower the periphery in this. Yeah. I just recently worked with uh, with a company that actually left that stage. It just came to my mind, and it was really funny. That person said, "Like we don't have an org jar," and um, which is kind of a positive thing, right? But then she's very then, good, right? And then she said, yes. "But but there is an org jar in everybody's mind." Um, so that is something. I said, "Why don't we just spell it out what it is?" But it's like everybody's tiptoeing around what it could be, and everybody ha- had their own impression of a, of an org jar. So they felt. The impact of it, but they just now they didn't have a visualization of the um, of all these command and control structures, which is kind of sad, right? But it started so off so well off with the uh, no org chart thing, but in, everybody had uh, an org chart in front of them mentally, and that's kind of sad. Yes. Um, oh yes, yes. Uh, I once was married to a, a woman who worked at Google in mm-hmm. Brazil. Uh, my ex-wife, she she worked at Google, and she told me one one day she came uh, came back from work and said, oh. Oh, we just recruited another another woman from. Uh, she came over from uh, American Express, and you do not. And she's uh, and she told me you would not believe how many paradigms she had. This woman has in her head. You know, she mm-hmm. has the org chart ready in her head. Like uh, that that woman apparently she came up and saying that okay, um, we we need an org chart here and the travel policy. And the Googlers would tell this this woman this Googler this new recruit. Mm-hmm. They would tell her you can draw up this kind of stuff, but don't. Expect us to follow your rules, mm, nice. which is very wise to under, to it. This yeah. is very much the spirit that Google at least had at, at that time, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and not allowing for yeah. not allowing stupid um, rules to come up. You know, yeah. you have to uh, um, educate everyone in an organization not to follow stupid rules, but to to um, to jointly. Be principled and disciplined within boundaries. You know, like uh, the boundaries described in the Agile Manifesto. For example. Mm. Well, speaking of um, you know uh, geographical locations, you know, are there any cultures uh, in this world that are uh, with your ideas are easier to implement than than others? Do you have an easier way somewhere? First of all, uh, it's not my. It's, uh, <laughs> from organizations like Google and Toyota and Southwest Airlines and WLG or, or DM here in, in Germany. Uh, mm-hmm. There are organizations around the world that are radically decentralized and uh, that have this, um, uh, that have left the, the sphere of command and control thinking. Uh, so um, in a certain way, in the beyond budgeting movement where I come from, from which I, I come originally, what we call now the, the beta codex or the beta movement, very much similarly to the lean movement, the agile movement. Uh, I think we find pioneers of these uh, of this thinking uh, everywhere in the world, literally mm-hmm. in every country. I've been in Brazil, in Argentina, in Germany, in the US, uh, and in Spain, and you find pioneers of that, uh, large or small, in, in every country. Okay. Um, so the this famous is- uh, Brazilian example, for example, is Semco, very well-known company yeah. that has been doing this for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, and um, I think I think we uh, really have the tendency to say, I'm, uh, that may work in, at Semco or at Toyota, but it cannot work here yeah. for people because <laughs> our people are stupid. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, which relates back to theory X thinking. You know? mm. It's like, oh, Agile can work at Spotify, but uh, our people are awesome software people. You know, they are just yeah. our developers. They are just, you know, Dumb, which is just an ugly prejudice about other people. Oh, absolutely. And we, I, I think that's the common thing to overcome. I, uh, I can, yeah. I can say. Well, let's put it differently. I think ninety-five percent of all organizations in the world are command and control, and mm-hmm. the distribution is pretty much the same everywhere. You have a lot so of so in work. Africa and so. 
in, right, in North America. We have a lot of work to do. Yes, a lot of a lot of we, a lot of, we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, Niels, the what I actually notice in the book, there's a list of companies you you're mentioning you have worked with or had some deployed some of those complexity tools. Uh, you mentioned some of those yes. Sappos, Aldi, uh, just to name a few others here. Obviously, the Google, the Southwest, the Spotify, and so on. What's really interesting about that long laundry list of uh, companies is I went through those and I was like, these companies are. Um, I would think, obviously, I haven't read their financial reports. Very successful companies for uh, for years now. Um, so there's something to this method, and uh, um, where you would you would take those tools, implement maybe a few of those, maybe all of those, but you see a drastic impact on on culture because all of those uh, companies. Um, uh, there were several others I, I can't that we call right now, but. I think the majority of them are super successful, and I think that speaks to to the to the tools you're promoting, and to the way how you level set agile teams in the right way by by looking at this book, um, and because it's Agile FM, and we're gonna have a lot of agile listeners. Uh, this is definitely a great connect for anybody who wants to implement um, agile in their organization. The thinking of that, the mindset of that, in combination of what you have to tell in this book. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Niels. And just want to... Just like, can yeah. I say one more thing? Of course. You mentioned Zappos. Uh, you mentioned Zappos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have been, I have been researching the Zappos case since it became you know, a well-known company, I think mm -hmm. 2007, 2008, when it became more famous. And when I published uh, my second book in 2009, I already, or no, in 2006... When I published my third book in 2009, I yeah. already got interested in Zappos. And uh, we know, of course, of uh, tools and methods that they implemented over the last couple of years. Recently, I had the opportunity to, uh, I had the pleasure to, to do a little workshop with Tony Shea and, his, uh, and one of his core teams about um, beta and digitalization and, you know, uh, getting back from functional division and from command and control and steering. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was for me particularly interesting, I mean, it's an, such an amazing company, and such having done such amazing things and, you know, always keeping up the spirit of, you know, uh, a very explicit, explicitly a federative culture. Mm -hmm. Still, they, of course, they have to work their organizational model very, very consciously. I mean, they have to, uh, and they are a growing company. They have been integrated into Amazon. There are lots of questions, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of surprises just to them. So uh, I found that particularly interesting, uh, a company that, that I idolized for quite a few years, that, yes. that they are seriously to how more and more federative and decentralized. They yeah. are looking to, you know, they, they were much, uh, I think, um, fascinated by the Organized for Complexity book. Uh, yeah. So it's never over, you know, Toyota also struggles with it. You know, oh, it's, absolutely. It's, uh, decentralization is never, it's not a job done. It's like Agile, it's never a job done. Mm -hmm. It's always in perpetual being. Yeah. Awesome, Nils. Thank you so Sorry much. Sorry for interrupting. No, it was no, a pleasure. No. no, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was a fun conversation. See you, and we we meet each other in Munich very soon. We, we're gonna meet each other in Munich. We're gonna see each other in New York. And for everybody who wants to connect with you, uh, Twitter. We said that in the beginning, and we also have NielsFlaking dot com. That is Niels with an I E. For everybody, uh, it's a different uh, uh, spelling here. Um, and that's just to get in touch with you and learn about your books. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon.